And right now, thousands of people, including Americans, they're waiting to leave Gaza through the Egyptian border. And among those who have already escaped, Dr. Barbara Zind, a pediatrician who traveled to Gaza to support the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. She was trapped in Gaza for nearly four weeks before crossing through the Rafah border yesterday when it first opened. And Dr. Barbara Zind is joining us now from Cairo, Egypt. Um, Dr. Zin, thanks for joining us. It's so good um, to see you alive and well um, outside of Gaza now. How are you doing? And did you think this day would come? Um, we really didn't expect it. At the night before we got the message that we were going to leave, we were planning on buying winter clothing and that it might last a while. So we were really pleased to be able to leave yesterday, yesterday morning. And now I'm energized and and relax, so it's great. And I'm sure ready to get home um, to your family as well. Um, what did you see in Gaza? What was it like to be there? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it started out with un unexpected missiles and bombing and almost consistent when we were in Gaza City. And so that was, you know, the move room was shaking, glass was shaking, so that was all you know, pretty pretty upsetting and pretty scary. We have been, then went to three UN centers. The last one we were at for about two weeks. We um, it was there were about 50 of us with um, different non-governmental organizations, different humanitarian organizations, all living together. Um, we were fortunate. We had food most of the time. We had water, but there were there was a growing number of internally displaced Gazans outside our center. When they were asked to, to leave the north of Gaza, there, the centers, the schools where people usually sought refuge were already full. And so they went to these UN police places that were not camps. They were, you know, either a vocational school or one we, was, we had was more of a facility to hold on to things. And even in South Gaza, we heard bombing all the time. We saw missiles from Hamas going overhead. Um, it was not a safe refuge for people coming from the north. So when you were there, when you were in these UN centers, Dr. Zinn, did you still feel as if um, your life was at risk? Well, you know, I wasn't living in terror, but right, yeah, we were right next to a Hamas center in one of the UN sites, and so there was some, there were some bombs dropped not too far away. Um, so, and you always worry about collateral damage. Um, we had drivers that were driving around looking for food for our group, and sometimes had to drive to North Gaza. And we know that roads are targeted many times, so we, you know, it was scary. Yeah. Um, I know that you knew somewhat of the lack of infrastructure already that Gaza was facing before this war even began, um, as you were arriving there as a visi visiting pediatrician to help um, um, Palestinian children. Um, what is it like now for them? I know that you weren't um, able to um, help in this last month or so um, because you were just trying to keep safe. But from what you understand and what you saw and what you've um, talked to with other people, what is it like now for them, especially in these hospitals? Yeah, I mean, I haven't been to the hospitals, but I have talked to some families that I know, families that are, are usually employees of PCRF. I mean, they're living without electricity, without water. The children that I saw would barely get medications like insulin that they needed for diabetes before this war. There was such a shortage. There was so such a block. There was a siege really before the war. And now it was, you know, such more of a siege. But I know that in the the local Gazans that were living adjacent to where we were, they weren't getting water. I mean, we were limited on water. We would run out of water for hygiene and flushing the toilet, and they ran out long before we did. And they were running out of drinking water. So it's down to the basics of food and drinking water. They were allocated only a minimal amount of food that the UN could could do at the center we were, but other UN centers with even more people had um, have an even you know more problems. And then of course the hospital, the hospitals that were hit, they're really r running out or ran out of medications. And with the fuel, there was problems with the ambulances getting fuel, problems keeping generators going, and just really the hospitals were running with a bare minimum. How do you reconcile, Dr. Zind, um, now that you are outside of Gaza, but knowing all the millions of Palestinians 
um, that will not be able to leave, um, that are still facing this persistent bombing. Right, you feel bad, you know, kind of, but there's nothing I was doing that was helping. I feel like talking with you, the more people aware are aware of the conditions in Gaza, the conditions that led to the frustrations and hopelessness that then lead to violent outbreaks afterwards. I mean, Gazans, you know, are very gentle people, very generous and gentle people just trying to survive. And the conditions that they're living in now, you know, even before the war are so difficult for them. Just, you know, we're just working, just trying to sell products, just trying to make a living and survive with their families has been so difficult. They were only getting, um, before the war, they were only getting four hours a day of electricity. Wow. And so, so they had constant rolling blackouts. They had a shortage of fuel to begin with. And then to totally cut off their fuel, cut it off for the sanitation plant, cut it off for the desalinization plant, cut it off for the basic um, food and necessities really that they needed. Um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out, Dr. Zins, and I think you can probably help us with this, is how people are actually finding out they're able to cross into Egypt, um, how they're getting word, especially with the connectivity issues um, in Gaza right now, and how um, people are being prioritized. You were one of the, the few that were able to get out um, yesterday. How did you learn you were able to cross in um, to Egypt finally? Um, how did you get word of that and then make your way to the crossing? That's a good question because today I got an email that um, on November 2nd, I should show up at the crossing at 7 a.m. But really I was on the list for yesterday. Uh -huh. So, um, so sometimes it's these decisions happen rapidly. Um, not everybody knows, but I was with a group that had gotten calls to go and, and the list was publicized. So I knew that we could go, but um, there's a lot of word of mouth. There's a lot of communication within the community of Gazans and, but you know, people have been waiting outside. Some people camping outside the Rafa border for weeks now, just not sure if they're going to hear the news or not. And how long were you, how far away were you from the Rafa border crossing when you got word you were able to cross? We were only a few minutes. People got calls in the middle of the night and we were ready to go. We were there by seven. The whole process of arriving at the Rafa border and leaving on the Egyptian side, walking to the taxi was about 12 hours. Wow, unbelievable. Dr. Barbara Zind, uh, we are thankful you're on the other side. Um, you are safe. I'm sure your family is incredibly excited um, to be reunited with you when you make your way back um, to the United States. Um, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time.